If I'm not kidnapped by my demons and thus prevented from editing this in a timely manner, this video will come out on Trans Day Visibility, which just so happens to be my favourite of all the insert marginalised identity here days. And I want to share the story behind that favouritism with you all at the end of the video, because it's a pretty cute story and heck, we're going to need a bit of a palate cleanser after some of the spicy content I want to talk to you about today, because Oh boy, yeah. When I say spicy, I don't mean fun spicy. I mean like, ow, 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 that really hurts levels of spicy. So, big heckin' spicy content warning for discussions of transphobia and transphobic violence, including murder and violence ingrained in policy, legislation and law, as well as self-hatred, suicidal ideation and suicide, and the neglect and abuse of trans children. Now, if that's too spicy for you, I totally understand. Just skip ahead to this time code in this general vicinity here to hear that cute T-Dov story. But otherwise, if you're game, Take a breath, brace yourself, because in we go. There isn't just the Florida don't say gay bill. Republicans are trying to make 2022 the year of the anti-trans bill. So far, over a dozen states are considering anti-LGBTQ plus laws. And according to the report from the Human Rights Campaign, 2022 could be the most anti-trans legislative year in history. 11 Republican-led states have enacted similar laws curbing transgender rights. Every week there are new stories in major British newspapers claiming that there is such a thing as a trans lobby, which they claim is silencing its critics, threatening the rights of women and girls, eliminating the existence of lesbians, or even endangering children. At 4.46 this morning, the House of Representatives passed the Morrison government's contentious religious discrimination bill. Should religious schools be able to hire and fire teachers based on whether they're gay or transgender? Well, Labor also supports the right of uh, religious schools to be able to hire staff that support the, the mission and the values of the school. Even if these proposals or these directives in this case um, don't become actual law. What are the impacts of directives and policies and laws like this on the trans community? I, I don't want to mince words here. Trans kids are going to die. It's a pretty rough time for trans folks right now, both here and internationally, including in a number of places where I know that perception is that things are improving for trans people. But I wonder where this perception of improvement has come from. In the last decade, we've seen a great increase in the amount of explicitly anti-trans policy and legislation, and the number of names in the Trans Day of Remembrance list continues to grow. And yet, it's also been a hot minute since I've had to explain what non-binary is to anyone under 70, and amongst my peers, I'm misgendered far less than I used to be. It's almost as if the levels of acceptance and hate are both on the rise. I wonder why that could be. As you may have guessed from the title of this video, I blame the rise in trans visibility for this phenomenon. In many ways, there have been extensive improvements to the quality of life for trans people since society as a whole has started to think more about trans issues. I've seen gender clinics funded, opportunities created specifically for trans people, and a degree of interpersonal acceptance that I could have scarcely imagined as a kid. I mean, admittedly, I was a kid of the 90s, and our media portrayals of trans folks at the time were, uh, not great. No, but even with all of those improvements, there's been a dark side. Developments on my home turf have been very concerning, and I mean, I heckin' get it, it's part of the course for the Coalition to try and enshrine in law a right for people to discriminate based on religion. I mean, our PM's a hecking happy clapper, what else do you expect? But, um, I was a bit surprised by the Labour Party, who's supposed to be for the working class, just being like, yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll give a thumbs up to that, only because, only because it was going to get through anyway. But like, how spineless, like, there were coalition MPs who crossed the floor on that piece of legislation. But the Labour Party's like, yeah, that's fine, we'll stop it later, we'll stop it later. How, how ridiculous, how gross. Um, but anyway, um, 
that 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 pissed me off, and so too did uh, the opposition leader Albanese going and doing that m- interview with the Murdoch press, where he was so like, "Oh, I'm so not woke. I'm so not woke. No, men can't have babies." Like, I know you want to appeal to the right wing, but you don't have to friggin' rub our faces in it. Anyway, I wasn't voting for either of those parties as my first preference. Anyway, I'm a green baby all the way, but still, it's pretty heckin' disappointing. Uh, if I'm honest. What's been happening around me has affected me less, weirdly enough, than that very specific anti-trans directive in Texas. The one that says that parents that affirm and support their trans children's identities are abusive. It's on my brain partly because I know our Prime Minister loves copying the worst parts of the USA's politics and bringing them here, much in the same way that Donald Trump took the worst parts of our politics and brought it over there by copying our abysmal treatment of refugees, but it's mostly on my mind because when I heard what was happening, I couldn't help but tap into that very specific and intense pain of knowing so clearly who I was, but being routinely misgendered and having my identity denied by my family. Knowing that something was wrong but not what, that was a different kind of pain. It's subtler, but everywhere, and it pokes at you on the regular when you least expect it. I mean, how could you expect it? You don't know that anything's wrong. The pain of being trapped in a wrongness that you know better than you know yourself, though, that's all-consuming. It's like you're thrashing against the waves in a rip that's determined to drag you under, threatening to drown you the moment you stop the struggle to stay afloat. Both suck, but you know what they say, ignorance is bliss. So with that in mind, is trans visibility even worth it? I guess if I were to think of myself and where I've sat in my trans identity, I can identify three key phases. The first, where I was lost, the second, where I was trapped, and the third, where I was affirmed am affirmed. I'm firmly in that third camp now, and I'm so grateful for that. It's so, so much better than the other two. When I was lost, I used to cry daily. Back then, I didn't know why. I, I guess I still don't really know why, but I'd hazard a guess that not knowing myself was a big part of that. And I know that I would not be where I am now if it weren't for the efforts of the trans community, the non-binary community, to be seen and heard. But that trapped phase was the worst of those three phases, easily. And I am so grateful that for me so far, it's been the shortest of all three. Knowing who I was and having tasted the feelings of euphoria and contentedness on the other side, meant that I was painfully aware of just how bad things were when I was not allowed to be myself. Before I had been gendered correctly, I had no idea how much being misgendered hurt. I guess it's like that analogy with the frog in the pot, right? That if you turn the temperature up slowly, the frog doesn't realise until it begins to boil alive. I guess, for me, being lost was like being that frog. And being trapped was like... I'd jumped out of the pot and realised, oh, it's kind of cool out here, but then was forced back in by a society that was determined to eat my little froggy legs, and all of a sudden, ow, ow, that water was really freaking hot. Having been out of the pot even just for a moment was enough to realise that, and so being forced back in was excruciating torture. In some ways, is it not better to just be ignorant of the fact that you're even in the pot? Uh, but hey, hey. Hold up there, Artemis. Yes, other Artemis? It just looks to me like you're implying that the problem is knowing you're in the pot. Well, yeah, but the frog that doesn't know dies more peacefully than the one forced back in. Yeah, but isn't the real problem the fire? And the people putting us in the pot in the first place? Of course, but there will always be fires and people wanting us to boil. The more we know about the pot, the more others with ill intent do too, and it just dooms us to more pain. But not knowing means we die in there anyway. Isn't it worth the risk to jump out of the pot and hopefully make it far enough to turn the burner off, either for ourselves or someone else? I'm um, getting a bit confused by the metaphor. Can we just talk straight about this? You know nothing we do is straight. Point taken, but yeah. Thanks. So, your point is that 
positive change requires visibility first, and you think that that's worth the risk of living in a world where some of us are trapped in an untrue version of ourselves and tortured with the knowledge that something better is out there? I'm not trying to imply that the pain of those of us in that situation means nothing. I've been there. I know what it's like. It's awful. And every minute that one of us has to stay trapped in that situation is an immense loss. But dooming those people to live their whole lives in ignorance is a loss too. You can't forget how much that hurt as well. Of course not. It's just... Those kids in Texas. I know. I know. And they're in for some incredibly brutal shit if this actually becomes law. But it's not law yet. And people are fighting it. People who know how much better it is to be authentically themselves. But surely we lose people in the meantime. Are, are their deaths worth it for the chance that things might get better? Of course not. But we were losing people who were lost too. Isn't it worth aiming for a world where we can experience some good alongside the pain? Where more of us get a chance at reaching that place of being affirmed. Yeah, but affirmation can be temporary. You can be forced back into a pot by your country being at war. Or a change in government or a change in workplace. <laughs> I thought you wanted to stay away from the metaphor. Yeah, yeah, I did. Sorry, but you get what I'm saying? There's no way out of this without some degree of tragedy. And that tragedy is not the fault of trans people just trying to go about our lives, nor is it the fault of trans activists striving to make the world a better place for trans people. <laughs> I guess so. There's no world where trans people cease to exist. Only one in which we all feel this sense of inexplicable wrongness whilst forced into closets of ignorance. Yeah. But there is a world where the vast majority of trans folks get to live most of our lives in that affirmed space. But visibility doesn't feel like enough to get us there, though. Oh, absolutely not. It's like, step one, at most. Well, like, there's so much more to do. Visibility is not enough. Contrary to what that idiom might have you believe, not all publicity is good publicity. Some of it will get you killed. Right? See, you're finally getting my point. Uh, oh. I, I thought you were saying the visibility in and of itself was a bad thing. I don't know, maybe it is. Maybe, but only if our efforts end there, right? Like, we're on the precipice of Autism Acceptance Month. Yes, which was a rebrand of Autism Awareness Month because actually autistic people know that everyone's aware of autism already, but we're still largely marginalised and maligned by society. Exactly. And the same goes for trans folks. We more than need to be seen. We need to be accepted and respected and loved, just like all the cis folks out there. Heck yeah, we do. So maybe we should rebrand Trans Day Visibility to something more active. Something like a uh, Trans Day of Justice. Or Trans Day of Ending Institutionalized Bigotry uh, or Religious Discrimination. Uh, uh, workshop that one. <laughs> Still kind of like Trans Day Visibility. Because of the story. Because of the story. Go on, tell it. I think now's the time. Okay. So, Trans Day of Visibility means a lot to me um, for a very cute reason. And uh, at least I think it's cute. You, you might disagree and that'd be fine. <laughs> but yeah, basically um, in 2016, I had basically felt the most affirmed in my trans identity yet. People were using they them pronouns for me, which was an actual revelation and I'd finally settled on a name that felt right to me and so I took my little butt to my nearest births deaths and marriages with the intent of getting that name change legalized and what do you know I rocked up and they said soz gotta go home we got no capacity for you today and I was I was spewing I was devastated but I took myself home and I determined that yes, I would come back the next day. I'd come back before they even opened to make sure that I was able to do it all properly. And that, that's what I did. The next day I rocked up, I'm sitting in the waiting room and I'm doing what people do when they're waiting. I'm scrolling on social media and I saw that classic post that people post on the 31st of March that goes something along the lines of, whoops, it's trans day visibility. I better not rob any banks today. I guess my crime career is over. 
bald now, you know, like those jokes. Um, I'm sure if you're in the trans community, you've seen them. They're friggin' everywhere, every trans day visibility. But I welcomed it on that day. A, because I was still newer to the community, so it was, you know, still kind of funny. Um, but also B, <laughs> because I realized through those posts that it was Trans Day Visibility and what amazing synchronicity that was to have been there changing my name, one of the most affirming pieces of my transition, um, to be doing that on Trans Day Visibility completely by accident. Like I was almost grateful to have been turned away by bureaucracy on the 30th, <laughs> almost. <laughs> Thanks so much for watching. Um, gotta admit this one was a bit ouch to make, but I'm really grateful to you for coming on this journey with me. And if, if you liked what I made out of it, um, feel free to let the algorithm know that it'd do me an absolute solid. I know that I, I'm, a, I'm a tiny baby bean on here. Um, I would like to one day be able to have a community tab. I think that'd be sweet. But you know, that's a bit selfish in me. Either way, I just hope that, you know, you got something from this video. Um, the trans community has given me so much and this is one of the ways that I'm attempting to give back to that community. So, yeah, um, hopefully, hopefully you got something out of it. Now, I do have a Patreon, which I'm contractually obligated by the people um, in it. To, to tell you about because their names have to come up here. Um, so if you want to also have your name up here, um, you can join them at patreon.com slash Artemis Munoz. And um, if you don't have money to throw around, you can still support me by watching another one of my videos. I got a whole bunch of those and um, I think they're kind of cool. And if you watch a few and you're like, oh, this person seems to make some fun shit, then yeah, why not hit subscribe and stay around? That'd be lovely, lovely. Um, Anyway, I just want to leave you with a big, 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 big dollop of love, especially to my trans community. It's a really rough time right now, but if we stick together, we'll get through it. All right. Thank you so much. Love you. Bye.